Whereas most people are familiar with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, many do not realize that there are other Gospels written by early Christians. These are other accounts of Jesus' words and deeds, His death and resurrection, many of them discovered just in recent times. Why were these other Gospels not included in the New Testament? In this lecture, we'll discuss these other Gospels as a group, when they were written, who their authors were, and whether they contain historically reliable information. We will then consider several of the more important and earliest other Gospels, written not long after the books of the New Testament themselves were produced. The word Gospel has both a general and a technical sense. In its general sense, as we've already seen, the word Gospel literally means good news. It's from an old English uh, term, godspel, which is a translation of the Greek word euangelion, uh, the word which uh, comes into English as evangelist, literally just simply means good news. Early on in Christianity, though, the word euangelion, gospel, came to be used of certain kinds of books that conveyed this good news, that is, accounts of Jesus' words and or deeds. And so in its technical sense, the word gospel refers to one of these books that narrates the events uh, in Jesus' life or his sayings. Some gospels uh, are almost completely concerned with the things Jesus did, and other gospels contain almost exclusively his sayings, and a third kind of gospel combines the two. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, of course, uh, are all of this third kind, where you have both the, uh, the deeds and the sayings of Jesus. In fairly recent times, people have become aware of the fact that we have a number of non-canonical Gospels, Gospels that did not make it into the New Testament. Many people have learned about these non-canonical Gospels from works of fiction, such as Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. In the Da Vinci Code, uh, the plot is based on the idea that there were these other Gospels that were in existence prior to, uh, prior to the formation of the canon, that these other Gospels according to the Da Vinci Code, were uh, older than the Gospels of the New Testament and more accurate than the Gospels of the New Testament, and in fact portrayed the truth about Jesus, in particular his marriage to Mary Magdalene. And so the, uh, the Da Vinci Code is predicated on this idea that Jesus and Mary were married as related in the non-canonical Gospels. I should say there are a number of mistakes in the Da Vinci Code, uh, as good as it is as a uh, book, uh, a real uh, page-turning murder mystery uh, of, of, uh, of real interest because it's witty and clever, and uh, of course it contains a conspiracy plot which everybody likes. Uh, there are mistakes in the Da Vinci Code, especially mistakes pertaining to these non-canonical Gospels. For example, one of the lead characters in the Da Vinci Code points out that some of the lost Gospels were discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which is absolutely false. Uh, there were no Gospels discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are not a Christian collection of books. They're a Jewish collection of books with nothing Christian in them whatsoever. But in any event, uh, the idea that there were other Gospels lies behind the Da Vinci Code, and this is one way that people have come to learn that there were in existence other Gospels. Uh, in the Da Vinci Code, it's claimed that there were 80 Gospels that were competing for a place in the New Testament. Uh, th that's a rather funny way of putting it, as if this was a, a contest that was to be entered by mail to see who, whose Gospel would get into the New Testament, but uh, uh, that isn't how it worked at all, as we'll see in a, in a later lecture. It's also not clear why uh, Dan Brown indicates that there were 80 Gospels that were uh, in existence. We don't know how many Gospels actually were in existence in the early church. We don't know if there were 80 or 800. What we do know is that there are 25 or 30 Gospels that survive today. Many of these Gospels are highly fragmentary. We don't have entire copies of these Gospels. We have simply little fragments of them that have been discovered, for example, in trash heaps in Egypt by archaeologists who were digging through trying to find matters of interest. Um, some of the Gospels, though, are complete Gospels that have been discovered, some of them in recent times, some of them we've had for centuries. These other Gospels, in fact, do not predate the Gospels of the New Testament, as intimated in the Da Vinci Code. These other Gospels tend to date from later times. 
The Gospels of the New Testament, of course, were all written in the first century. The non-canonical Gospels start appearing in the second century, and they extend down through the Middle Ages and on till today, where occasionally one still finds Gospels being forged and passed off, or being attempted to be passed off, as authentic. For historians of early Christianity, the most interesting of these other Gospels from outside the New Testament are the earliest ones, which date from not long after the time when those of the New Testament were produced. It's true, though, that these other Gospels, uh, uh, I'm sorry, is it true, though, that these other Gospels were vying for a spot in the New Testament, and that in many instances they contain more accurate historical information than the ones that did make it in? Is that, is that a true claim, as found in the Da Vinci Code? The easiest way to get a sense of the character and historical value of these non-canonical Gospels to see whether in fact they are historically accurate is simply by examining individual instances. And so that's what we'll do in this lecture. What I've decided to do is to look at three non-canonical Gospels. These are three of our earliest Gospels. They are not earlier than the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're nonetheless among the earliest of the non-canonical texts. They all three date probably from sometime in the second century. The first gospel that I want to look at is a gospel that's called an infancy gospel. The full title is The Infancy Gospel of Thomas. This book is called an infancy gospel because it deals with a time in Jesus' life that the canonical gospels are virtually silent about, namely his young life. The question that's driving the infancy gospel of Thomas is a question that may have occurred to other people, uh, even in modern times. If Jesus was a miracle-working Son of God as an adult, what was he like as a kid? Well, unfortunately, we're not told in the canonical gospels very much at all about Jesus' young life. We have accounts of his birth in Matthew and Luke, as I indicated in a previous lecture, and we have an account of Jesus as a 12-year-old boy in the Gospel of Luke, a very short account of him visiting the temple during a Passover feast, where his parents leave uh, and actually leave him behind in Jerusalem and then have to go back and search for him. Those are the only stories we have about Jesus prior to his baptism by John the Baptist as a 30-year-old in the Gospels of the New Testament. The infancy Gospel of Thomas is one of the non-canonical Gospels that tries to fill in the gap, tries to explain what Jesus was up to as a young boy. It turns out in this infancy Gospel of Thomas that Jesus as a young boy had all of the power that was his as the Son of God. He was still able to work miracles, he had supernatural powers, but it also turns out that he has a, uh, a bit of a mischievous streak uh, in him. And he ends up using his power sometimes in order, to, in order to hurt those who irritate him and sometimes in order to heal them. So let me just go through some of the interesting uh, episodes that we find here in this infancy Gospel of Thomas, which I think was probably written uh, in the mid uh, of middle of the second century. It's, it's a little bit hard to date this text because there's no reference to external events by which you can, you can date it, but most scholars think it was written sometime in the mid, mid, middle of the second century. The Gospel starts out with Jesus as a five-year-old boy. And in the first episode, we're told that Jesus, as a five-year-old, was playing by the ford of a stream. And he gathers into a pool, uh, into a pool uh, the waters that are rushing through the stream, and he orders these waters to become pure, and they're cleansed immediately on his word. Jesus then takes some mud beside the stream, and he forms 12 sparrows. Unfortunately, it was the Sabbath when he did this. And a Jewish man walks by and sees what Jesus has done. He's formed 12 sparrows out of mud. In other words, he's made something. He's, he's done work, and you can't work on the Sabbath. And so the man goes off to jo Jesus' father, Joseph, and he reports, Look, your child at the stream has taken mud and formed 12 sparrows. He's profaned the Sabbath. When Joseph came to the place and saw what had happened, he cried out to Jesus, Why are you doing what's forbidden on the Sabbath? But Jesus clapped his hands and cried to the sparrows, Be gone! And the sparrows took flight and went off chirping. This is a brilliant scene. Uh, Jesus destroys all evidence of malfeasance. Uh, 
12 sparrows? What 12 sparrows? They've, they've all flown off. And so uh, he, uh, he, he's gotten away with, uh, with breaking the Sabbath law. When the Jews saw this, they were amazed, and they went away and reported to their leaders what they had seen Jesus do. That's the first story. Now, uh, it turns out that there's a, a child playing with Jesus by the, by the pond, by the pool, and uh, the uh, son of Annas the scribe is one of them. He, Annas the scribe, take, the son of Annas the scribe, takes a willow branch and he scatters the water that Jesus has collected into this pool. Jesus is irritated with him. He saw what had happened and Jesus said to him, this is a five-year-old Jesus speaking, you unrighteous, irreverent idiot! What did the pools of water do to harm you? See, now you also will be withered like a tree, and you will never bear leaves or root or fruit. And immediately that child was completely withered. Jesus left and returned to Joseph's home, but the parents of the withered child carried him away, mourning his lost youth. They brought him to Joseph and began to accuse him. What kind of child do you have who does such things? <laughs> so Jesus uh, using his supernatural powers. Well, somewhat later, Jesus is going through the village and a... Uh, a, uh, another kid is running through the street and he runs up to Jesus and he bangs him on his shoulder and uh, irritates Jesus. And Jesus turns to him and says, you'll go no further on your way. The child falls down dead. Uh, so, uh, and so it goes through this account. Well, uh, at some point uh, the uh, parents in the village get upset, uh, especially with Joseph and Mary for having a kid like this that is out of control. And so they uh, urge them to do something. And Joseph decides, well, what, what what we need to do is to give the boy an education. You know, education solves all of our social problems. And so if Jesus will just get an education, he'll learn how to, how to control his power. And so Joseph decides to send him off to a, a teacher. Well, this teacher knows about Jesus' reputation, so he's a little bit nervous uh, uh, about, um, about teaching him. But he finally agrees that he'll teach him. And he says to Joseph, first I'll teach him Greek, and then I'll teach him Hebrew. And so he's going to teach him how to read. And uh, first he needs to learn the alphabet. And so he says, uh, okay, Jesus, let's learn the alphabet. Repeat after me. Teacher says, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. Repeat after me, Jesus. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. Jesus doesn't say anything. The teacher gets upset. Jesus, why don't you reply? Jesus says to him, you tell me the power of alpha, and I'll tell you the power of beta. Teacher thinks this is a smart aleck reply. Smacks him upside the head single greatest mistake of an illustrious teaching career. <laughs> Jesus withers him on the spot. <laughs> and so it goes. Uh, finally, uh, there, there's another episode that happens in which Jesus is playing with a, a, a bunch of kids on the top of the roof. You'd wonder why kids were still playing with Jesus at this point, but they're, they're, they're playing with Jesus on top of the roof. And one of the, these are these flat roofs in Palestine where you can get up on top and uh, one of the kids trips and falls and lands on the ground and dies. Uh, the other children see this and they're, they're frightened so they, and they scatter. But Jesus goes over to the edge of the roof and looks down and sees the dead boy there. And just then, of course, the dead child's parents come up and they see their dead child, a child named Zenon, lying on the ground. They see Jesus up on the roof and they think, oh yeah, he's at it again, he's killed another one. And so they get all upset and start accusing Jesus, but this time he hasn't done anything. So Jesus uh, leaps off the roof lands next to the dead child and says, Xenon, rise up, tell me, did I throw you down? Xenon rises from the dead and says, no, Lord, you did not throw me down. You have raised me up. And uh, from then on, Jesus starts using his powers for the good. He, uh, he uh, heals those that he's withered. He gives uh, sight back to those who, that he's blinded. He raises from the dead those who have died. And, uh, and so the story goes on. And it turns out that Jesus is, uh, uh, uses his powers for the good. He turns out to be remarkably handy around the carpenter shop. When uh, Joseph is making the, a bed for a rich client, uh, he miscuts one of the boards so it's too short. And he's going to incur a financial loss because of this. And so Jesus says, don't worry, Dad, here, you, you get on that side of the board, hold on to it. So Joseph gets on that side, Jesus gets on the other side, and pulls it out so that it's the right length. Uh, and there, thereby saving his father from uh, losing the deal with the, uh, with the rich client. Well, the story uh, of the infancy gospel of Thomas ends then with Jesus as a 12-year-old boy in the temple arguing with the teachers of the law, uh, which is the story that we have in uh, the gospel of Luke, chapter 2. This then is the infancy gospel of Thomas. It's one of our earlier gospels from outside the New Testament. 
Uh, it's uh, therefore one of the Gospels that's relatively ancient, but I think most historians and probably everybody else would agree there's not much historical information here. It's not clear whether the stories told in the Infancy Gospel of Thomas are told for their pure entertainment value, or if the person who wrote this was really serious and thought that this may have been what Jesus was like as a child. It's hard to tell whether uh, the uh, account is meant simply to be entertaining or if it's meant to be taken as a, as a serious narrative. But in either event, there seems to be little here that would be of historical use to those who want to know what Jesus actually said and did. My point is, is that uh, this, this will be the first instance, that there are, there are Gospels outside the New Testament, but, but these Gospels are not more valuable historically than the ones that are within the New Testament. Let me turn to a second Gospel now, which deals not with Jesus' uh, young life, but with his death, the Gospel of Peter. The Gospel of Peter comes to us only in a fragment that was discovered in the tomb of a, uh, of a monk during uh, the, the tomb was discovered in the 19th century. There was a French archaeological team working out of Cairo in 1868 that was digging in the uh, in a part of Egypt, in the southern part, of, a little bit southern part of Egypt called Akmim. Um, Akmim uh, is an area that archaeologists had have dug in uh, over over the years, and this archaeological team was digging up uh, a cemetery in Akmim, and they were digging up a part of the cemetery that was uh, that was uh, made in the eighth century. They dug up a tomb of a monk who'd been buried in the eighth century. Uh, this monk was buried with a book, and the book had several. Uh, several stories in it, several accounts in it. It was an anthology of texts. One of the texts discovered in this anthology was the Gospel of Peter. It's a fragmentary text. It begins in the middle of a sentence and it ends in the middle of a sentence. So it's not a complete gospel the way the infancy gospel of Thomas is. The infancy gospel of Thomas, we have the beginning, the middle, and the end. The Gospel of Peter, we, we don't have the beginning and we don't have the end. It's, we have a fragment in between. It begins in the middle of a sentence, and the sentence uh, says uh, that, that it begins with says, "None of the Jews wished to wash their hands; therefore, Pi uh, therefore Pilate stood up." And so, apparently, what's happened is Pontius Pilate has washed his hands, and then he stands up, and then there there's a continuation of the trial scene. So, this is an account that begins in the middle of the Passion narrative. It begins with uh, the trial of Jesus before Pontius Pilate, and the account then continues on telling the account of the trial, Jesus' death by crucifixion, and then it gives an account of his resurrection, and it begins to give an account of Jesus appearing to his disciples, but it ends in the middle, middle of a sentence. So that we have simply a fragment, and it's hard to know whether this Gospel of Peter originally was just a passion narrative, or whether the Gospel of Peter was a complete narrative, like the Gospels of the New Testament, that, that began with giving the words and deeds of Jesus, and then gave uh, an account of his death. The part we have, though, it is uh, extremely interesting. As I've indicated, it begins with, uh, with none of the Jews wanting to wash their hands. That's an interesting point to make, because in the, the, the only Gospel that talked about Pilate washing his hands is the Gospel of Matthew. And in Matthew's Gospel, uh, Pilate washes his hands, but it, uh, saying that he's innocent of this man's blood, but it doesn't say anything about Jews not washing their hands. Why does it say that here? Because one of the points of this Gospel, which is different in many respects from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Passion narrative, one of the points of this Gospel is going to be that the Jews are particularly culpable for the death of Jesus. This Gospel blames the Jews even more than the Gospels of the New Testament do for the death of Jesus. In fact, in this gospel, it's the Jewish king, Herod, who orders Jesus' death, rather than Pontius Pilate. Verse 2, the king Herod ordered the Lord to be taken away and said to them, do everything that I ordered you to do to him. And so they take Jesus out, and they, uh, they uh, flog him, and they, they rough him up, and then they crucify him. We're told something very interesting in verse 10. They brought forward two evildoers and crucified the Lord between them, but he was silent as if he had no pain. 
he was silent as if he had no pain. The reason that's interesting is because we have an account of a gospel of Peter from the early church. We have a reference to the gospel of Peter by a church father who mentions the gospel of Peter and says that it came to be rejected from the canon because it had a docetic Christology. If you remember from a previous lecture, a docetic Christology indicates that Jesus didn't really have flesh and blood. He wasn't really a human. He only appeared to be human. Well, this text could be taken to be, this could be interpreted docetically. He was silent as if he had no pain. Well, that could be interpreted as meaning he didn't suffer, and that's why he was silent. So they set him on the cross. They, they, uh, they kill uh, him along with the, uh, the two others. The, uh, one of the interesting episodes in this is that the, one of the robbers uh, uh, mocks Jesus, but one of the robbers tells the uh, Romans that they have no business crucifying Jesus because he's done nothing wrong. The Romans are angry at this guy for reviling them, and so they refuse to break his legs. And that's all the text says. They refused to break his legs so that he would die in torment. The idea is that when someone was crucified, uh, the, the way they would die by crucifixion is they would, uh, they, they would suffocate because their body would hang down or their lungs would extend. They couldn't breathe any longer. And the way to, to make it possible to breathe is you'd push up on the nail through your ankles so that you could, uh, so you could breathe. They would, if they broke your legs, though, you couldn't do that any longer and you would die sooner. In this gospel, they don't break his legs so that he die, takes a longer time to die. And so it was a way of punishing him, not breaking his legs in this gospel. Well, we're told that um, throughout this gospel, this, this brief fragment we have, that the Jews were glad that Jesus was being killed. And uh, so the Jews are really uh, seen to be at fault here. The most interesting part of the gospel, though, comes at the end. This gospel, unlike those of the New Testament, gives an actual account of Jesus' resurrection. Now, in the New Testament Gospels, Jesus is buried, and three days later, the tomb is empty. But there's no account of him actually coming out of the tomb. In the Gospel of Peter, there's a narration of the resurrection event itself, and it's very interesting. Posted a guard at the tomb of Roman soldiers. And as they're looking, uh, right before dawn, the skies open up and two angelic beings descend from heaven. And as they descend, the stone in front of the tomb rolls away by itself. The two angels go into the tomb and then there come out of the tomb three people. Three men emerge from the tomb, two of them supporting the other. So presumably the angels are supporting Jesus who's been crucified. With a cross following behind them. So the three of them walk out, and then the cross emerges behind them. The heads of the two reached up to the sky, but the head of the one they were leading went up above the skies. And they heard a voice from the skies, Have you preached to those who are asleep? And a reply came from the cross, Yes. Very interesting account. You have a giant Jesus and a walking, talking cross. How this thing came to be excluded and lost is beyond me. Obviously, this is a symbolic statement. Uh, the, the cross is representing the salvation that Jesus himself has brought. The question is, has Jesus' salvation reached to those who have died previous to Jesus' death? And the idea behind this text is that the, the salvation brought by the cross of Christ is, uh, it brings salvation. It's salvific even for those who've died previously. Have you preached to those who are asleep? Meaning, are you, have, has the gospel gone to those who have died? And the answer from the cross is yes. Well, the, uh, the narration then ends with uh, the, the author identifying himself, uh, where uh, he indicates, uh, I, Simon Peter, and my brother Andrew took our nets, and we went off to the sea. This is after the resurrection. And with us was Levi, the son of Alphaeus, whom the Lord, there it ends, stops there. So whoever's writing this is claiming to be Peter, 
Uh, and the, the account is going to go on and give a, uh, a narration, evidently, of Jesus showing up while they're out fishing, an account similar probably to what we have already in John chapter 21. Here then we have a very interesting account uh, of Jesus' trial, death, and resurrection. It appears that this account is not more historically reliable than those of the New Testament, but it nonetheless is an interesting account that shows us how people were thinking about Jesus' trial, death, and resurrection in the second century. We move now to the third gospel we want to consider, a gospel called the Coptic Gospel of Thomas. It's called the Coptic Gospel of Thomas because it's written in the ancient language Coptic, an Egyptian language. This is a gospel that was discovered in modern times, discovered in 1945 among a cache of manuscripts in Egypt near the town of Nag Hammadi, Egypt. A collection of manuscripts discovered then. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas is the most interesting of the 45 separate documents discovered in this collection. There are actually 13 books that are all anthologies, and these books contain 45 separate uh, accounts, including this Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas contains 114 sayings of Jesus. Many of these sayings are unlike what we get in the New Testament Gospels, although some are like what we get in the New Testament Gospels. Scholars continue to debate this book, the Coptic Gospel of Thomas, and virtually every aspect of it, because some scholars have claimed that the Gospel of Thomas was written before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and is more historically accurate than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Most scholars, however, think that this is a Gospel that came about in the second century that it may contain early sayings of Jesus, but that, uh, but that on the whole, the sayings that are not found in the New Testament Gospels are not trustworthy for knowing things that Jesus himself actually taught. Some of the sayings are very much like what you get in the, in the New Testament Gospels. For example, here in this book, in the Gospel of Thomas, one of the 114 sayings is the parable of the mustard seed that you get in Mark chapter 4. Or another example, saying number 54, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. That sounds like the New Testament Gospels. Or saying number 34, Jesus said, If a blind man leads a blind man, they both fall into a pit. Okay, the blind leading the blind, like the New Testament Gospels. But there are other sayings which are unlike what you get in the New Testament Gospels. For example, Jesus said, If the flesh came into being because of spirit, it's a wonder. But if spirit came into being because of the body, it's a wonder of wonders. Indeed, I'm amazed at how this great wealth has made its home in this poverty. Well, it's a very interesting saying, but it's rather strange. It's unlike what you get in the New Testament Gospels. Or consider saying number 56. Jesus said, whoever has come to understand the world has found only a corpse. And whoever has found a corpse is superior to this world. There are a number of sayings in this Gospel of Thomas which seem to presuppose that this world we live in, this material world, is an evil place and that some people are trapped here. They are spirits that are trapped in this evil material world because they're trapped in human bodies. Because of this kind of teaching, it appears uh, to many scholars that the Gospel of Thomas is best understood as a Gnostic Gospel. Gnosticism was a 2nd and 3rd century uh, form of Christianity. In fact, there's a lot of forms of Christianity. Gnosticism had a lot of different kinds, there are a lot of different kinds of religion that we call Gnosticism. But they all emphasize that this world is an evil place and the spirits who are trapped in this world need to escape. They escape this world by learning the truth of their existence, of who they really are, that they in fact don't come from this world. They come from another realm. They're spirits who have been entrapped here. The Gospel of Thomas seems to presuppose this point of view. The world is a corpse, and anyone who discovers that is superior to the world. How does one escape this world? In Gnosticism, one escapes this world by receiving true gnosis, true knowledge. So it's interesting that the Gospel of Thomas begins by saying, whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. 
Salvation does not come for this gospel by believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus, which isn't talked about. Salvation comes by understanding the secret teachings that Jesus delivers. This appears to be a Gnostic gospel designed to provide liberation for spirits who are entrapped in this world. In short, there were other gospels available to Christians in the second, third, and later centuries. For the communities that, uh, in which these gospels were read, these no doubt constituted scripture. But few of them enjoyed the wide distribution of the gospels that eventually uh, made it into the New Testament did. Most of these other gospels are late in comparison with the canonical texts and more obviously filled with legendary accretions to the life and teachings of Jesus. As a result, the four gospels that made it into the New Testament appear as a rule to be the oldest and most widely used accounts of Jesus from Christian antiquity.